Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. Now, today we have a really interesting, um, different approach to what we usually take. We're actually having another Conversations at the Coalface. Conversations at the Coalface is where we have on a guest who has been on the inside of one or multiple acquisitions or exits so they can tell us what it feels like from a different perspective to the usual perspective we're talking about from the um, owner or the buyer or the um, advisor perspective. So today's conversation at the coalface is with Catherine Fraser, who was a practice manager of a dental practice at the point that it was sold after her being there for many years and the owner owning it for more than 40 years. And she talks about her experience and the experience of the other staff in being in the middle of this sale and some of the issues that she saw that had occurred and some ideas that she has for buyers about how to avoid some of these issues in the transition phase when a buyer acquires a a business or a dental practice like this example. We also drill into the missed opportunity for the vendor in this instance and I think it's a really insightful discussion for anyone who is looking to sell the business either now or into the future and also to buyers who are interested in looking at buying uh, a business into the future. So buckle in, here we go with Catherine. Catherine, hello. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. No problem. Look, I'm really excited about this discussion today because I'm always excited when we can get into talking to people at the coalface because I I guess sitting here in the position of advisors, we have one perspective, but it's always great to hear the perspective of people who are in the inside of a deal and feeling how they feel about it all. Now, one of the things that we're um, particularly talking about today is is, I guess, the potential missed opportunities and and your example here, we're we're going to dig into the missed opportunities here for for the vendor in this deal. But the second component of where I'd love to go with you, if we can, is a little bit into how it feels to be in the middle of a deal and and what you see as things that, you know, perhaps went wrong that could um, could have gone better or, uh, you know, I guess tips that you might have for some of our listeners now that you've had the opportunity to be on the inside and see what it looks like to yeah. have gone through this process. Yeah, for sure. It, with a really unique insight because you're, you're coming, I guess, from a far less emotional perspective than what the um, vendors or the buyers are coming from. So everyone has their own position and their own um, uh, and their own insight based on their own um, situation as to how they're looking in. But I think this is a really important one, how the staff feel um, and, and what happens in the environment that can make or break a deal from your perspective um, in relation to what you had experienced in this deal. So let's um, step back Just to give some background, can you give us a bit um, of a quick background about you and then then what this business sale related to? Yeah, sure. So I've been in the dental industry for 22 years now. Um, Started out as a dental nurse, got all my qualifications and really loved it. I found it was a job, you know, it wasn't something that I was thought that I'd enjoy, but it was something that I really did enjoy. And later on, I went on to do some more study for my practice management qualifications as well and moved out of the surgery and into administrative side of things. That was probably about 16 years after I started. So I've got quite a broad overview of how a surgery is run Mm. and just all the cons and cons and pros. Mm. Yeah, and so it, it's been an interesting journey working with different dentists, different practices. Um, the practice that I was working in quite a few years ago now was a single dentist practice. He was 
a bit older and, and often joking about retirement. And so for all of the staff, it, because it was only a one dentist operation, there was just a small team of four people. But we all knew that at some point he'd come to us and say, you know, I'm either going to sell or I'm just going to retire and close or, you know, we didn't know exactly which way he was going to go. Uh, we just knew that, you know, he was coming to the end of his career. And it was a practice that had been there for a long time. He'd actually worked in it for over 40 years. Wow. Yeah. And he'd bought it from a, another dentist back in the day. So it had a great number of patients, um, a great reputation. We didn't do any advertising at all. We didn't even have a sign on the door. Just people found us, people knew about us. It was just a great little practice. Wow. But even knowing that he was going, like thinking about uh, retirement and joking about that to us, we were still a little shocked when he came to us one afternoon and just said, I'm just letting you know that I've sold the practice and the new owners will be here next week to meet the team and see how we do things and um, and we'll give you a bit more information then. It was just kind of like I'm I'm waiting for that conversation but then when it came I still was like, oh, wow, like he just said it. Mm. He's mm. done the deal. And you thought that there would be some some sort of discussion. And do you know what? This is such an interesting point because so many vendors that I talk about um, are really concerned about talking to staff at all uh, about their thoughts and ideas. Well, yes, you run the risk of losing employees as well because yeah. they don't understand the process, then they get scared and they think, well, you know, I could p- potentially be out of a job. So mm. maybe I should start looking now. So I have my employment security. So there is a risk in in putting that on the table and being open about it. But I think you have to assess the team that you have, how long they've worked for you, even how old they are, because someone that's going to be a bit older is going to have a little bit more maturity and be able to have a conversation like that. And look, I guess you're saying the reality is he didn't have that conversation with you, but you all knew it was coming anyway, even though he hadn't been open about discussing it. So the fact that he hadn't been open about discussing it meant, A, that, you know, even though it seemed obvious to you all, it was a surprise at the time, which isn't a great thing, you know, that, that can create instability but I guess B as we're going to hear about um, it potentially led to this missed opportunity as well. Yeah so the missed opportunity for me was that um, a couple of weeks later I was just going through a a dental journal magazine and they often have classifieds in the back of that you know selling dental equipment or positions vacant or practices for sale and sure enough there was the ad that he'd placed um, and, you know, the contact details all matched up. So we knew that it, that was the ad and, and it had mm. the price right there in front of my face and I was astonished wow. at how cheap he sold it for. And I just straight away said to one of the other girls, I would have bought that in a heartbeat. Mm, isn't yeah. that amazing? Uh, so tell me then w- what what happened with the practice. So now we've got the practice having been sold to someone who has no connection, who ha- has had no connection in the past to the practice. So what did that look like? So the fact that we were based in a regional area also added another layer to that because mm. the people that bought it came from, from Sydney. Um, they had no intention of moving to that area and, um, you know, being connected with the community and the patients that um, had been coming there for all those years. I mean, we were seeing three, sometimes four generations of um, patients within a family because they'd all just come to that practice that had been there forever, you know. So Mm. a bit different to the way the city operates. But, um, Mm. yeah, so they they really took something that was a a family and community-based practice and turned it into a money-making machine without Mm. sounding horrible. Mm. Mm. Um, But when that's your focus in business, then, you know, things are bound to go wrong. Mm. Staff will have issues with losing clients. So Yeah, so can you step that out for us a a little bit more? Because this is, you know, certainly not all acquisitions go the way that a buyer or even a seller has planned yeah. post transition, and you know, I, I think it's really useful if we can hear from you. What are some examples of um, the approach of the buyers, perhaps that 
that you know led to some of these you know what the downturn was in the business and what the approach was that you feel was a contributing factor to that uh, into how it changed things or yeah how it changed things so firstly let's uh, let's step back and just look at w- what actually happened so we had a practice that was going quite well um, yeah. new buyers come in new buyers are, are focused on perhaps um, running the practice in a different way to um, the the previous owner um, and that led to loss of clients loss of staff is that right yes yeah, so well one by one all the staff left all the staff I was the last to leave wow so that was over a two-year period um mm. yeah some of them left in really unreasonable and horrible ways mm. they the the staff that we had a or we'd all as a team we'd been working together for quite some time so you know it was a really good team but we had built relationship with the patients that were in that practice as well and so when you take away that element of relationship with the patient and it just becomes well you're just a number now you know mm. you're a number in my waiting room and I'm I want to see you as quickly as possible treat you and, mm. and get you out of the room it completely changes you know the the trust and the whole experience really for them to like no one likes going to the dentist anyway that's a given and so it's going to create a space where they feel comfortable and that they're in good hands. And so when you treat people like they're a number, you're not giving that assurance and that level of comfort for them to feel like they can just relax and, and get what they have to get done even though it's not, mm. you know, it's dental treatment. Mm. And so... All the staff left in the end, a large client attrition. Do you, ha- do you have any idea uh, sort of of the level, like we're we talking about half the clients left or was there a, ma- a very large act? Or? In the time that I remained there, it would be hard to say. Um, he had quite a large patient um, database, but um, I still work in the same town at another practice and um, we've gained many of their patients Mm. so I can only imagine that their numbers are declining and not going so well Mm. Uh, a huge number of people I mean again people don't like change either so um, when they've been seeing a particular dentist for a certain amount of time and they have that level of trust and relationship uh, from that health professional then once that's gone then you've got to rebuild that with the person that's replacing that health yeah so yeah that's a hard thing to do if you go about it the wrong way then you potentially lose that patient you lose that client yeah so let's dig into that a bit more what what um what you think went wrong in the buyer's approach and and obviously you've already touched on probably what is one of the most relevant elements which is the way that they dealt with the client database the patient database obviously in this industry but maybe if you can if you can step back and just look at it you know from what you could see from the inside what were things that you felt they did wrong that uh, you know business buyers should be aware of when they're buying the type of business that we're describing here? Yeah, I think they firstly need to make um, a a good impression with the staff. These are the people that are going to serve you vision and they're the ones that are ultimately going to make you money. You treat your staff well, you treat your patients well, then the money just comes. That's Mm. the byproduct of creating good team and a, a good relationship with the patient's that we already had. So that was probably the hardest thing for me, just seeing the way the staff were treated and the way they were dismissed or Mm. almost forced to leave because of the way they ran the business and, and the lack of relationship that they you know didn't have with with the staff Mm. and that has a massive impact you know as soon as someone leaves as well that has a massive impact it it does it affects the whole team but also the patients that have been coming on a regular basis and know that place know that team they straight away recognize that something's not right do I not trust these new health professionals Mm. because now the team are walking away there's something not aligned here it sends a message you know to the patients as well when staff start to leave if you have a high turnover of staff as well Mm. you know they they think well who are these people that they're working for that they go through so many staff that all sends a message so um I think even if in the mm. in the process of the sale and that waiting period um, before everything was finalised for them to come and try and 
work alongside us in the current practice and and make that work and and build some kind of relationship that would have made a big difference and and maybe a bit more Mm. communication but and you you know it's such a good point because I I think it's something some buyers particularly more sophisticated buyers I think have a handle on the massive importance of team in making this transition work but I think uh, for many buyers who aren't used to the the concept of acquiring a business they perhaps are really focused on, I guess, focused on so many things. It's a busy time when you're buying a business, but not focused on some of these things that really can make a massive difference at the end of the day in terms of retaining, capitalising on the value of a business because I guess it's an opportunity, isn't it? So in in your instance, it was this team that had been with someone who'd been there for 40 years, so maybe was getting a little bit tired of the business and perhaps didn't have a big vision for the future. And here's the opportunity for a buyer to come in with a vision that they sell to the staff and, you know, reinvigorate things or in the case that happened in your um, case, uh, you, you know, fail to uh, make a relate, create strong relationships, fail to provide a vision and um, ultimately end up losing all of the staff and the knowledge that was around. Well, the interesting thing on that too, just um, still talking about staff, losing staff, is that the, the dentist that sold the practice um, I believe he still wanted to work part time and phase himself out without, you know, mm. selling the business that releases him to not have to take on the responsibility or or the costs of running the business. He doesn't have to carry that weight anymore. But I think he was still really keen to continue working, even if it was only two days a week. So having said that, you know, I was going to say that you know another issue in in terms of staff is is the rate of change so implementing new systems and new procedures and and all these um you know we've got so many different types of software dental software and things now and and different types of equipment um you know implementing that too quickly as well creates an issue for the staff um but uh, one of the people that also left was the actual dentist that sold the practice. So um, he couldn't cope with the rate of change in terms of, especially someone that's been doing something a certain way for so many years. Um, he's now got mm. someone that he has to answer to. He's not his own boss. He has to learn new software and, and new ways of doing things based on what the new owners want. Mm. So I think going back to how can you make it easier in the buying process or the changeover process that you really make the staff participate in in the change process don't try and change it overnight and do 50 different things you know implement something one by one and let them get the hang of it instead of bombarding them with a whole bunch of stuff and leaving them feeling mm-hmm. overwhelmed and incapable and go, I'm, I'm out, I can't do this. Mm, it's a really important insight. This is, um, this is brilliant stuff. I absolutely love it. And it, do, you, do you know if the seller had any sort of retention or anything riding on the, the, um, the business retaining clients for a particular period of time post-sale? Uh, yeah, there was. I'm not sure what the details were, but mm. um, I do know based yeah. on... on some of the associates that they hired after that, um, they all had a 100-kilometre radius, um, not being able to work within that 100 kilometres. And part of the issue here is when uh, vendors, you, you know, it's important for vendors to um, to be interested as well in the steps that buyers are going to take in, I guess, dealing with the transition of the business after completion. You know, firstly, I, I think quite often people who are selling a business that they've um, owned for a long period of time are very emotionally connected to it and to the staff and to the to the clients or the patients in in this instance. So you know that's one thing. But you, you know the second thing is that in many instances there are financial consequences to them of the buyers losing clients into the future because you you know they might have earnouts or, um, or or something that um, that you know, can be a financial consequence to them of the buyer losing 
um, clients or patients soon after completion or for a period of time after completion. So there's lots of reasons that it should be at, of interest, not just to the buyers, but also to the sellers, how this staff piece is being dealt with. And, and I just feel that's one element that quite often isn't dealt with brilliantly. And I think it's because both parties are scared of communicating, yeah. you know, they don't know how to. For sure. Definitely. Okay. And then, so we've talked about the staffing element. Are, are there other elements that you saw that, you know, you would recommend based on what you saw um, other buyers maybe do differently? Um, yeah. Look, I just think coming back to to relationship with, with the patients, I think it's the most important thing. Um, it's, it's more important than the treatment required or anything else that's going on or how much you charge. I mean, you can, you can charge whatever you like when you have that rapport with your patients. Um, it, it, to me, it is the most yeah. important thing and, and everything else flows out of that. So yeah, that has to be your focus. Mm. Otherwise you, you're going to run into problems mm. one way or another, whether it's finances or staff or, you know, even a bad reputation because people go out and they talk, you know, Oh, I went and saw this wonderful dentist today. Mm. Oh, I went and saw this terrible dentist today. That's that's going to happen, especially in a regional area. So mm. um, that has mm. to be the most important thing to to really build on that relationship with the patient. Mm. And I don't think it's just in a regional area. And and you know certainly your experience is that it's true for a regional area. But um, you know any relationships yeah. business, I think that's it's you know wherever it's based, you're a hundred percent correct. Oh look, these are really interesting insights. So I just want to thank you so much um, for all of the information that you've been able to share with us, Catherine. I think, as I said, when we first started talking, it's such an important viewpoint that often we don't hear about um, the staff perspective in relation to how the whole process has, has gone and how it could have yeah. been <laughs> a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really useful insights. Um, I guess, do, do you have any sort of key things that you want to leave our audience that you haven't been able to share with them so far? I mean, the first thing I, I can definitely identify out of what you're talking about is um, be really mindful when you're thinking about selling, about where the opportunities might be for a sale. Because obviously, in in your instance, it's interesting that that you felt that the um, price was uh, was really cheap as well because it might be that it was really poorly priced. <laughs> there's, a, there's a great tip as well. So if you're going to sell a practice, get an appraisal. There's dental companies out there that will do an appraisal of the practice. They'll assess how many patients you have, what kind of equipment you have, how old it is, you know, all your systems. Um, the staff that you have, they will actually mm. do an appraisal and and put together a price for you. I, I think based on the number of years that he's been there and how many patients he actually had, he, he really undervalued what what he had and and sold that for, for next to nothing. And and even that price I think attracts then a certain kind of buyer. So it's someone that's out to make yeah. money. Here's something really cheap. Let's turn it into something else and then let's just sell it off. You know, it, it, it takes the personal side mm-hmm. of things out of it, the relationship side of things as I've spoken about. But, um, yeah, definitely get an appraisal of what the practices actually worth because, um, yeah, if you don't want to undersell. Mm. And so it sounds like he didn't use an agent or a broker in selling. Is that right? Yeah. Again, I don't know the details because he didn't communicate anything to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although if he's advertising himself, although you don't know, but. uh. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I think it was just maybe a bit of an old school. Let's put an ad in a magazine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, When I saw the price, you know, I was already struggling a little bit with the the changeover. But then when I saw the price, I was like, oh, wow, you know, I would have. I would have bought it in a heartbeat. He could have stayed on and he could have had his own terms. I, I wouldn't have minded. He was such a wonderful person to work for. And then I probably would have mm. just taken on an associate that would slowly increase um, as he decreased and, and transitioned that way, which also would have made the rate of change an appropriate rate of change for the staff as well. So that, I mean, mm. hindsight's a great thing. Um, it didn't happen, <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that's been a bit of 
insight from someone that's been in that situation. Yeah, what a missed opportunity here. Uh, (laughs) But it's a really interesting tale and hopefully something that gives our listeners a bit of insight into if they're they're, um, looking at uh, gearing up for a sale of their business, just some things to um, think about, Uh, some really good points um, to make sure they don't miss the same type of opportunity that um, your uh, your ex boss yeah. missed. Well, look, I just want to say a massive thank you, Catherine. You've been fabulous. This has been really useful. I've loved it. I hope you have too. <laughs> yes, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. Well, that's it for this episode where we had another conversation at the coalface talking with Catherine Fraser all about her experiences from the inside when she was part of a dental practice that was sold um, and things didn't go exactly to plan. There are a few key items that I'd really like to highlight from my discussion with Catherine because I I thought it was extremely insightful hearing her perspective. Um, Her first tip is is to think early about communication with staff. So um, obviously there's this question for many sellers of businesses as to whether or not they should communicate their potential plans to, to the staff. Catherine makes an interesting point that the staff in this instance had already been well aware that this would be on the cards at some point. And so in this instance, the seller's decision not to have some sort of communication with the staff over time about his plans for the practice meant that he missed a golden opportunity for making a sale to a potentially perfect buyer um, in a staff member. But of course, it's not just about communication prior to the sale. And many sellers have very good reason for not wanting to communicate their um, ideas of a sale to the staff due to perhaps perceived instability that that may cause. But Catherine also pointed to the benefit that is there for communicating to the staff as soon as possible after exchange has occurred. So to ensure that that transition is something that the staff are ready for and geared up for and not perhaps surprised by when it it comes about. Catherine also pointed to the importance in slowing down in implementing wholesale new systems. Of course, when buyers go into a business, they're often extremely excited about the opportunities within the business and have all sorts of ideas about how it could be run much better. But it's a really good point from Catherine about the instability that constant rapid change um, in systems and processes uh, and approaches can have on the staff. So if you're looking at it from a staff perspective, then it's really important that you really slow down and think about pacing out the change process for new systems. And Catherine had a great idea about making staff or inviting staff to participate in the change process themselves so that they feel some sense of ownership and connection to the process that's going on. Well, this has been a great episode. I hope you found it interesting. Um, If you would like to see further information about what we talked about today, then just pop over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. There we will also have links to our legal eagles at Aspect Legal. If you're gearing up for a sale or an acquisition and you want to talk to lawyers who've been around the block more than a few times who can give you some of these insights into the sorts of things that we see that contribute to a great deal and that can be risks in in, uh, creating to problems in deals. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment if you'd like to find out how we can assist. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed our episode today. Thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. Are you looking for a top quality legal team to assist you in your organisation? 
Aspect Legal is an innovative commercial legal practice that specialises in providing fast and professional services for their clients. If you'd like to chat about how we might be able to assist you, simply head over to our website at aspectlegal.com.au to book in a time for a free discussion with one of our lawyers. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.